Okay, well, uh, hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this recorded version of my presentation uh, held recently at the Nordic Academy of Management Conference uh, Early Career Initiative. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to, um, to some of you, and um, I was uh, delighted actually to have the opportunity to reflect on the topic. And uh, the topic of this uh, presentation is basically some thoughts on how to manage your academic career. That's a big topic. It's a very wide topic. I could, I could choose to, to go in a lot of different directions. And I spent some time preparing for this and thinking about kind of my own career, um, what I did well, what I didn't do so well, what I could have done differently. I thought about all the conversations I've had uh, and uh, with with people over the years, and a lot of the um, a lot of the points that I'm going to bring up uh, in this uh, presentation are points that have been shared with me uh, by senior academics. Uh, I've been to a number of, for example, of uh, professional development workshops at the Academy of Management that have dealt with aspects of managing your career and uh, it was really a pleasure just to to have a thought about these different um, elements of your career and and how to make sense of some of this so what i'm going to give you here are just some of my experiences some of my thoughts uh, your thoughts may be different uh, your experience might be different and and that's okay so i hope there's something in here that you can use and uh, and otherwise, uh, too bad. And and uh, hopefully you will uh, you'll anyway listen to me, and 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 it'll uh, get you to think about things. So I want to focus on uh, you know how to manage your academic career. And you can say, you know, there's this uh, there's this funny picture here that's been uh, circulating uh, that's been circulating on. Um, you know, on different social media and so on, uh, that sort of shows what is it like being in academia, you know, and the idea is for the first five years, uh, you feel like a unicorn and everything is wonderful. And then, you know, once you hit sort of mid-career, then uh, you start to feel like a, an old uh, misused donkey, perhaps. Uh, I would say that's not necessarily true. It certainly doesn't have to be true. Um, but the point is that you, as an academic, you do have to consider your academic career and you do have to accept and acknowledge that you have to manage your own career. It's your career, so you have to take responsibility. And in that sense, the academic career is perhaps different to a lot of other careers. Uh, in, in many careers, you will find that your employer, for example, will take some degree of responsibility in terms of developing you, uh, in terms of uh, looking for ways to progress your career, uh, identifying talented individuals and helping them to progress. That, I find, is not so much the case in academia. In academia, you're a little bit more on your own um, although there are systems in place for promotion, and we'll get back to that in, in a minute, you're going to be a little bit lonely in terms of managing your career. And so you have to take responsibility for your own career and make sure that, that uh, A, you're progressing in the way that you, that you want to progress, and B, that you make sure that you protect yourself and that you uh, try to build um, conditions around you that will keep you happy, keep you motivated, um, keep you healthy. That, that's actually very important. So we're going to get back to some of these many points. And um, basically, the topics that I would like to talk about are the following. I want to start with understanding the career steps. So I want to just outline the career steps. And I think that's an important part to managing your career is to start by thinking about what are the the stepping stones, what are the, the hoops that I have to jump through in my career, because that will uh, create a kind of path for you as you uh, move forward, right? So, so understanding what are the steps is going to be a, a very useful. 
The second issue I want to talk about is finding time to do research and to write. One of the things that you uh, will figure out in an academic career is that there's a lot of competition for your time and sometimes there are very conflicting um, things like like you know if the more teaching you do the less time you will typically have for research for example um, and so you have to protect your research time and I want to talk about that as, as one of the first kind of important topics I also want to touch on work-life balance uh, I've heard some very interesting talks about this, um, you know, people sharing their experiences. And, and so I wanted to bring some of those things uh, in here. I want to talk about teaching and service because it's such an important part of the life of an academic. And by service, I mean, you know, all of the administrative tasks, uh, leadership tasks that you might undertake and so on. I want to finish off by talking about networking, the importance of networking, and um, in the end also touch a little bit on what I call reviewing dialogue and rejection. Um, and what I want to finish on is the idea that rejection is part of life as an academic. So it's important to build some stamina around this. Okay, so uh, those are the topics. So if we start right off with the career steps, understanding the career steps, I would say that the steps are somewhat standard, but of course the journey is unique. And the somewhat standard steps tend to look like this. You start life in academia as a PhD fellow, so or, or doctoral candidate, right? So you're starting life by doing your PhD. A PhD is a researcher, a research education, so you learn to become a researcher. And after that, the typical path would be that you either do a postdoc or you go straight into an assistant professorship. The next step after an assistant professorship is an associate professorship. And after that, you would have a, what, you know, just a professor title or what some people call a full professorship. So those are the typical sort of stepping stones. From the PhD, you, do to, you go to sort of assistant professor, then from there to associate professor, and then to full professor. However, uh, this is not the path in every country. In some countries, you have other titles. And here I've just given you, for example, the alternative titles that are used in some British universities. So in some British universities, you have the title of lecturer, senior lecturer, principal lecturer, uh, you even have something called reader, okay? And in other countries you might have other titles. In Germany I know they have a system where I think the professors are called W1, W2, W3, um, at least in some places. Um, and, and, and there may be other titles, right? So every country uh, will have its own system and even within one country you may find that there are multiple systems that define these career steps. In some countries, an assistant professorship is a three-year or five-year or even seven-year um, fixed-term position. That means that you have a contract that lasts for a number of years. Uh, and after those years, you are evaluated. So in some countries, it's a tenure-track system where automatically you get evaluated and if you pass that evaluation then you move into a tenured associate professorship. So that's in some countries. In other countries there is no tenure track. So there's no guarantee that when your contract runs out there's a position waiting for you as you know at the next level. Um, in some UK universities you can go straight from a PhD fellow to a lecturer position and that lecturer position is already a permanent full-time contract um, and then and then from there you may or you may not uh, you know get promoted to a senior lectureship etc is not uncommon in uh, in many universities that you can remain at for example a senior lecturer or an associate professorship for life uh, so there's no guarantee either that you ever make it to full professor. Uh, many people have a, have a great career, 
um, just just being an associate professor, right? So that is, or or being a senior lecturer. I mean, th those are absolutely, um, you know, it's absolutely a high level uh, uh, position where you are tenured and 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 you uh, you have a job for life, right? So uh, different countries, different systems, different universities, different systems. So you how do you manage this then in terms of your career well one thing you need to do is make sure that before you apply for positions you understand the system that you're applying into you understand what that position means and you understand what promotion opportunities exist beyond that position how do you get to the next position right you need to understand that because otherwise you may end up expecting something that's that's not real you may take, for example, an assistant professorship, expecting that you're going to be able to progress on to associate professor when maybe that's not the case. Or you may take a postdoc position, expecting that after that postdoc runs out in two years or three years, that then there's going to be permanent employment for you. But that may not be the case. So you need to be very clear uh, in your mind, what am I going into? What are the steps and what does it mean for my career. The steps are somewhat standard, but the journey is unique. I mean, every person's journey is gonna look slightly different. My journey was a journey from PhD to postdoc to senior lecturer to principal lecturer to associate professor and then on to professor. I mean, that's a lot of different titles, right? So, but that was my journey and your journey may look different. Um, my journey took me to, uh, so, so basically all in all, that's four different universities from, from PhD to postdoc to my, my lectureships and then uh, to the, the professor title, right? So th those were four different universities. Your journey may be different. You may be staying in the same university or you may change university even more. I worked in three different countries. You may stay in one country or you may work in more countries. The journey is unique. Uh, but it's certainly important that you understand those uh, career steps. And one of the things that the career step or the position itself um, is important for uh, and, and is, is basically that, um, you know, if, if you think about your job, so what does it mean to have a career as an academic? Um, it means that you are going to be conducting research, you might teach, you might take on administrative or leadership positions in a university, um, etc, etc. And so the many things that are important to you in terms of your career, uh, those things are actually contingent on the institution that you work for, the university, the particular employer, and the position that you hold. So for example, something like the teaching load, right? If we look at the teaching load, for example, the teaching load, how many hours you have to teach or correct exams or supervise students, these kind of tasks, um, the number of hours that you have to dedicate to these things will actually be contingent on the university. So different universities will have different rules, different expectations in terms of how much teaching you have to do. Okay. It's also contingent on the position. So for example, in a postdoc position, typically you would have a low teaching load. You would be more focused on research, right? Um, whereas in an associate professorship, maybe your teaching load will be bigger. And then an important thing to remember, and I think I learned this a little bit late. I didn't quite realize early on in my career, and I think a lot of people don't realize exactly how much you can negotiate. But the point is, all of those things on the left-hand side, or actually most of the things, not all of them, but most of those things can be the subject of negotiation. Okay? So things like your teaching load and how you teach online, offline, lectures or seminars or supervision or whatever uh, is determined by a combination of the university, the institution, the position that you have or that you've applied for, 
and the negotiation that you have with your manager. The same goes for admin and leadership roles. Things like research time, how much time you actually get for research from your institution, right? Again, it's contingent on the university. Different universities have different uh, norms. Different positions have different expectations and you can negotiate this. Also the position funding, how the, the position is funded, the expectations in terms of external funding application, how much money do you have to go out and, and, and look for yourself, your ability to supervise, the funding available for travel, the support provided to you by the university, and the opportunities available for promotion. All of these things, all of these elements, I would say are really important elements to your academic career. These are important things for your academic career. They are the things that are, that are going to make you happy or not as an academic. And those things are all determined by a combination of the institution, the position, and your ability to negotiate these things. So if we look at the position, you might say that as a standard, as a sort of rule of thumb, early career scholars tend to get more time for research and you know, less emphasis on administrative or leadership roles, you know, committees and these things. So as an early career, I think my advice would be to take advantage of this. Um, I made the mistake early in my career to actually have a lot of folk, or let's say accept a lot of leadership responsibility. And that was great from, perhaps it was great from a money perspective because it meant that early on I made a little bit more money than the normal junior uh, academic uh, because typically you will get some sort of reward from, for, for doing this. But on the other hand, it came at the expense of research time. So actually, I wasn't as productive as a, as a junior scholar as I could have been. I realize that today. But normally, you would have a small amount of admin and leadership and so on, committees and so on, when you're, when you're a junior scholar. Mid-career, this tends to grow, right? So this tends to grow, and also your teaching tends to grow. And the research shrinks a little bit. And I would say, as you get towards senior, um, there is a bigger expectation on leadership, but you tend to have also uh, to be able to find a little bit more time uh, for research. And then of course there's emeritus status, which is a little bit different because there you may or you may not get uh, paid by a university. You may or may not have uh, great expectations and so on. Um, Institutional differences. Here's an example of institutional differences that I have experienced. Uh, while I did my PhD, I actually, uh, or, or my doctorate, I actually worked uh, in a uh, University of Applied Sciences uh, in Switzerland. And there, for example, the research allocation, so how much time the institution gave you for research, depended purely on external funding. You were expected to bring in money uh, so to get grant money that could be used to buy out your time to do research. Uh, when I worked in London at uh, uh, Middlesex University in London, there the research allocation depended uh, largely on publication output. So if you were publishing journal articles in good journals, you would then be given time to write more publications, if you like, to do more research. Okay, so research was research allocation was predicated on a steady output. Um, in Denmark, and at, I'm I'm now at Roskilde University in Denmark, a small um, a university just outside Copenhagen, and here basically the research allocation is guaranteed by a union agreement, and you can then add to it through external funding. So it's kind of a mix where you have a basic uh, research allocation, time for, for, for doing research, and then you can add to it by pulling in external funding. So again, three different institutions, three different universities, three very different models for how you uh, get time to do the research that you want to do. And then there's the negotiation element. So there are things that you can always negotiate, in my opinion. First of all, teaching load. Uh, 
at the very least, you are able to negotiate what you should teach. There's usually institutions will be quite happy to accommodate you if you say, listen, I would really love to teach on this course or that course, or you know, I would like to supervise more uh, master students rather than bachelor students or whatever. So there is some scope for negotiating here, at the very least, how you use the teaching load. And to some extent, you might also be able to negotiate when you start a new academic job, you might be able to negotiate that at least, at least for the first you know, year or two years or whatever, you might be able to negotiate that you have a reduced load. You might be able to say, listen, I'm new in this environment. I need time to integrate fully this university. I would request as part of my package when I start here that for the first two years, I have a reduced teaching load, right? This is something you can try to negotiate. You might not get it, but it's something you can try to do. Um, admin and leadership roles. Uh, the thing is universities uh, have a lot of things that need to be done. There's a lot of jobs to be done. Committees, you know, promotion committees, uh, evaluation committees, PhD committees, this and that, you know, uh, uh, department head, program leadership. I mean, there's, there's tons of work that needs to be done. And while you may not be able to avoid completely doing these, you can certainly negotiate what jobs you prefer to do. So you can certainly go to your head of department or, or, or dean and say, listen, I would love to contribute by being on this type of committee or I would like to get experience with this time of leader, type of leadership role. Okay, so you don't have to wait until somebody whacks you over the head and tells you you have to do this or that. You can be proactive and negotiate what you want to do. Research time, it's the same. When you start a new job in a new university, if they really want to hire you, if you are the preferred candidate, it doesn't cost much to give you a little bit of extra research time. It's something that you might be able to negotiate quite easily. Okay. Um, just flipping the slides a little bit here, not on purpose. Um, Position funding, this typically you cannot negotiate. I mean, some positions are externally funded, some are funded internally, um, and, and this may be difficult to change anything. The funding application expectations, again, this is something where it's very institutional. I mean, uh, some institutions just have bigger expectations than others. Th th this may not be easy to, to negotiate. The ability to supervise also may not be the easiest one. Um, I would leave this with a question mark. The reason being that a lot of universities nowadays have rules regarding, for example, PhD supervision, where they say you have to be an associate professor or higher in order to supervise, for example. So it may be that if you are a postdoc, you don't have the opportunity to supervise students. Um, Funding for travel, that's definitely one that can be negotiated. Again, when you start a new role or when you have a yearly uh, you know, salary discussion or whatever with your, with your uh, dean or your head of department, you can certainly influence this and ask for money to be put aside, right? Um, and there may be other types of support that you can negotiate, things like access to databases, you know, uh, that's again the, a classical one that actually, well, the institution might be very happy to to help you to, in, in by buying you access to some data that you can argue is going to lead to good publications, right? Um, opportunities for promotion. Again, there may be some opportunity. I think promotions is something that you need to talk to your, you need to be in a dialogue with your head of department. From the moment you get hired, uh, and basically, you know, for the rest of your career, you, you need to be in that constant dialogue and there may or may not be a lot of room to maneuver. In my experience, the, the, the room to maneuver is somewhat limited. It, it's very much dependent on the institution and the position. Um, everybody wants to pro be promoted, obviously, and, so, and, and not everybody can be promoted at the same time. So. It, it tends to be a little bit difficult, but it is something that you can still bring up and have a dialogue around. And concerning promotion, 
I mean, some of the success criteria for promotion that are worth having in mind. So if you're managing your career and you want to get promoted, I think some of the key criteria, but again, think about what is your view and what is your, uh, what is your uh, experience, because your experience may be different than mine. But certainly I think something that is always looked at is journal publications and, and preferably ones that are, are in journals ranked in things like the Academic Journal Guide or, um, you know, or, or the Australian uh, ABDC um, uh, uh, guide, right, or, or, or list, uh, or some other list. So, so basically, journal publication is very important. Conference papers, to some extent, having conference papers in, in you know, top conferences sends a quality signal. It just sends a signal to, um, to your employer or to your future employer that, that, you, you, uh, that there's quality here in your research. Um, when I say success criteria for promotion, remember that a lot of promotions in academia, even if you look at the careers of top, top academics, a lot of the, the promotion actually takes place when they change employer. It's, it's very normal that people move from PhD student to assistant professor by changing university, from assistant to associate by changing university, from associate to full by changing university. Um, so think of promotion as being something that may require you to move. That's a little bit stressful, but that's one of the ways that you can actually move forward in your career. And when you do that, definitely important to have the journal publications, some good conference papers, and then universities will also look at research funding. Uh, have you attracted, have you been able to attract external funding? All universities are desperate for money, except a few. I mean, there are a few that, uh, that don't need to worry about that, but you have to think of things like, you know, the famous ones, uh, Oxford, Stanford, uh, whatever, uh, Harvard. I mean, these are outliers. These are not normal institutions. The normal institution is happy to get some external research funding and, and, and actually depends on it. So demonstrating that you're able to do this is very important. Awards of different types can also send a quality signal. So that's certainly good. And then, of course, you do have to show that you have some teaching experience that you have some experience with service, that you have, uh, you have been willing to, uh, to do work for the institution. And of course, attitude is always gonna be really important. Having a proactive, positive attitude about your career, about academia, about your employer. Um, and in the end, showing also that you have a network. I think academia, um, the idea of this lonely researcher just uh, sitting in, in, in her or his office, uh, uh, just hiding away and doing their research and, and never talking to anyone, I think that's an absolutely wrong image. Um, on the contrary, research is a team sport. Uh, research re requires that you are open to and part of a community uh, that a community that helps you to become a better researcher, a community that gives you feedback on your research and, and to whom you give your feedback and, and that you are helping, right? And, and you demonstrate this by showing that you have a network. You can also demonstrate it through reference letters, uh, but it's really important to have that. So these are some of the success criteria and, and my advice for somebody in terms of managing your career is to think of always how am I managing to tick all these boxes? And if I'm not, if there's a box that I'm not ticking, what can I do to make sure that I do tick it? Is there something I can do to make sure that I tick that box as well? Okay, that was a lot of time talking about understanding the career steps, but I think once you understand your, your uh, career steps, uh, everything else kind of then uh, kind of falls into place in the sense that then then you're working towards uh, that career, building that career, right? So what are some important things in terms of managing uh, your daily career, let's say? Because managing the, the career promotions and so on, that's, those are the big steps. But in between, you have all the nitty gritty. Well, 
One of the key themes that I always hear and, and that I think is important to bring up is this idea of finding time to do research and write. Um, a career as a researcher is a career as a writer. Uh, still to this day, despite the fact that we now have, you know, uh, YouTube videos and TikToks and, and, and God knows what, um, it's still the written word that is the primary way of communicating our research to others of uh, and, and, and of providing feedback to others and, and basically engaging with the community. So writing is really, really important. So you need to prioritize and dedicate time for writing. It's also really important to legitimize writing. So, you know, it's, it's a legitimate activity for you to shut yourself in your office and write, you know. Um, that's, you know, you're not doing something bad. You're doing the right thing if you're spending time writing. And so, you know, you have to think of it in this terms, in this term that you kind of, you build your identity as a researcher and writer. Think of it in those terms. How do I build my identity? And it's a constant thing. I mean, uh, you know, and you, that that you do, um, and and you you try to sort of build up this um, uh, this version of you that is the writer, right? The researcher and the writer. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, we. I said earlier on that we tend to get pulled in all sorts of directions as, as academics. We have to teach, we have to lead, we have to sit on committees, we have to do all sorts of other things. Um, but really at the heart of it, I think it, it, the successful academic builds their identity first and foremost as a researcher. Uh, I mean, I tend to say to people who want to come and do a PhD, and I talk to a lot of young people or and middle-aged people for that matter who want to do a PhD and they want to do a PhD because they enjoy teaching. And, and I try to say to them, well, you're not going to learn to be a teacher. I mean, doing a PhD prepares you to be a researcher and a writer. So if you don't enjoy writing and if you don't enjoy that, the, doing research, then maybe a PhD is not for you. It's also important, I mean, one thing you can do, and which, which I've tried to do, is to make writing a social activity. Writing doesn't have to be you going into your office and closing the door and sitting there alone and sweating. By all means, a lot of people do that, and there are a lot of successful writers who work in that way. But writing can be a social activity. Uh, there are things that you can do that will make it something you do together with other people. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. That, and the last little piece of advice is I would also say, as a writer, make sure that you reflect on the art of writing. Make it your passion to also understand how do I write a good paper? How do I, how do I become better at writing? Okay. And there are some things that you can do here. Here are some ideas. Join a writing course. I mean, why not join a writing course? If writing is so important, you, you're going to find there are courses out there, both for academic and, and for non-academic fiction writers, right? Where you learn to become better writers. Or you can attend PDW, so professional workshops around methods, right? Again, it's about building your identity as a researcher and a writer. And there are, in all the major conferences out there, there are PDWs focused on issues of methodology and issues of writing. You could also read a book on academic writing. A lot of great books out there uh, to pick up, so I'm not even going to suggest one in particular. Uh, just go out and look, and you're going to find lots of books uh, that have been um, uh, created, edited books or, or authored books that are about academic writing. Uh, those are really interesting, actually. They give you some inspiration. You could also join a writing retreat. This work works really well for me. I actually organize writing retreats for PhD students. Uh, I've been doing it for many years. And it's really great. You go away for one day or two days or five days even uh, to a place which is not your home. Uh, and you sit with other people who are there to write and you write together. And, and this, this is about the social aspect of writing, right? The social aspect of writing is also that you seek feedback on your writing. Ask a senior colleague 
can I show you some of my writing? If I send you my, my uh, you know, just my finding section or my methodology section of a paper I'm working on, would you mind to give me a little bit of quick feedback? You don't have to send a whole paper to people. If you send a whole paper, 10,000 words, and you ask them to, to comment on it, it might be too much, you know, a, a colleague who has to spend half a day reading your paper, that's a lot of work. But if you send them one section, or you send them an abstract or whatever, right? And you say, oh, I have this abstract. I'm not sure how good it is. Could you read it and give me a bit of feedback? People are going to be more willing because they think, oh, yeah, this is going to take me 10, 15 minutes. No problem, right? You could also find a writing buddy. A writing buddy is somebody you sit down and write with. I have a, I have a colleague who, who does this. Uh, she meets with another colleague. Uh, they meet in the library. And they'll sit down for two hours in a, at a fixed time every week. And they just sit down opposite each other in the library and they sit there quietly and they write together. That creates a commitment to each other, right? Uh, that we're going to write. I mean, it, it's similar to going to the fitness, right? As, as most of you probably know, it's easier to go to the fitness if you have a fitness buddy, somebody who calls you at, you know, Monday morning and says, hey, uh, when are we going to the fitness? You know, uh, it's the same thing with a writing buddy. Hey, when are we going to sit down and write? Okay, let's do it. You could find a mentor. Um, a mentor could be could be anything. I mean, it could be a professional. There are professional mentors out there that, that you can you can find and you can Google them and you'll find them and and you can pay them to basically be a, a writing mentor for you. But you can also just find a senior academic, a, a colleague, or even a you know even a junior one. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But somebody who is willing to be a mentor for you, uh, who will give you some feedback, some coaching. Um, you know, and, and just help you in your writing, in your research, maybe even in general, in your career. Scheduling writing time works well for some, uh, not so well for others. That means that you block times during the week that are writing times, where you refuse to have meetings, you refuse to teach or do anything else. You, that's your writing time. And finally, I would say writing is closely related to reviewing in the sense that... Um, by reviewing for conferences and journals, you actually get to experience uh, writing, other people's writing, and it makes you more alert to what is good writing, what's bad writing, and, and how can you improve your own writing. So I think doing that is, is quite useful, as well as reading in general. Just, just making sure that you read papers, it will inspire you and, and so you will soak up the language and the format and, and how to do things. So it's, it's extremely helpful. So with this, it comes naturally sort of the, the question of, okay, one thing is that you need to find time to do research and so on, but what about your private life? So what, what about the work-life balance? And I don't want to labor too much on, on, on this. I don't want to talk too much about it. I mean, I think that uh, I, I tend to think of it in terms of, of this um, particular uh, um, diagram here. I mean work-life balance is really more than work life I mean it's basically balancing time for your family uh, for a partner um, having time for hobbies uh, something that can that can inspire you outside of work but of course also having time for your academic work uh, taking care of your your physical body um, taking care of your spiritual needs right and and also having a social life uh, beyond just your family and, um, and and your partner right so uh, actually having a social life beyond is also rewarding and maintaining balance simply means that you don't go too long um, neglecting either of these uh, or, or one of these elements right so if for too long you're neglecting your physical well-being uh, you're going to be out of balance. If for too long you neglect um, your hobbies, it, there's also a risk that it, 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 it brings you down. If you neglect, uh, of course, a partner for too long, that's also bad for your balance. So you need to, and the point is here, you are in charge of your career. So you need to actually take responsibility. Uh, it's no good to blame work, you know, uh, you, you've got to blame yourself. You've got to take responsibility. 
so that's an important uh, element here. And what are some of the things you can do? I mean, you could separate work and personal life. Some people say that it's important to separate these completely. Some, some have a lot of success with this. Um, so some people are able to, you know, go to work from, from eight to four and then, you know, go home and say, that's it. I'm not looking at emails. I'm not continuing to write. I'm not preparing a lecture. I'm just going to focus on my personal life. So in a sense, you could call this being dual centric so that you, you know, when you're at work, you're centered on work and you're committed and fully in, in flow. When you're home, you're centered on home and, you know, fully committed there. You could also schedule. So, I mean, certainly scheduling things is useful. So scheduling research and writing time, um, but also schedule, I mean, scheduling other things. So scheduling your hobbies, scheduling uh, uh, some spiritual time if you need that, Sch uh, scheduling um, some time out with your partner, right? Uh, making sure that you get away. I mean, one of the things that that, um, that can work very well and then that I've certainly done is, is schedule some times uh, during the year when you and your partner take time off alone, where you're actually able to um, to go away together, for example, right? Go to a hotel or a retreat or or whatever it is uh, so that you, you actually nurture your relations, right? And so in that sense, thinking about scheduling things is, is quite important. Being fully present when you're home is certainly an important uh, thing. Um, I have not always been good at this. Um, and I think that's quite common let, that you let work uh, take over a little bit at home as well, but, but it's not healthy, right? So you need to make sure that you're fully present in whatever it is you do, and you need to take time to rest and recover. An important thing to learn is to prioritize. And I think that's, again, that's something where I have tended to say yes to too many things. It's an important skill to learn to say no, um, but say no selectively just like you say yes selectively so you need to be able to say no both at work and in your private life you may not be able to say yes to all the invitations that you get to go out with friends to go you know uh you know or to see family or whatever i mean you have to also be able to say no in your private life right um, just like you have to be able to say no sometimes at work and and a good thing to practice is that if you say yes to one thing, you should consider saying no to something else. So if you add something onto your plate, think about what can you take off your plate. If you say yes to this, consider saying no to that, right? Um, maximize outside help is a really useful idea. This is something that I, I know a, a number of academics who uh, who practice this and this is a way for them to actually manage to have a better work-life balance and I think it's really it's a really useful thing outside help can be your parents uh, or other family members it could be friends of yours your neighbors it could be a professional cleaning help a professional gardener people who you can outsource uh, things to so parents, friends, neighbors could take care of your kids for a while. You know, they could uh, help you out. Maybe your parents or, I don't know, uh, a friend or sibling could help you to go shopping or, you know, and, and, and you can maybe spend some of your salary to actually pay for a cleaner, you know. So the idea here is all the things that are actually, uh, that you can outsource and without well, you know, without causing harm, I mean, where it's not a, it's not a problem, you know, your kids are not going to suffer if they spend an afternoon with, with their grandparents, but it will allow you to spend that afternoon doing something else. For example, spending time with a partner or spending time with your hobby or going to the fitness, right? So that's the thing. So actually this idea of maximizing outside help is actually a really useful one. And then I would say, be positive. I mean, make sure that you stay positive. I do see colleagues who become negative over time, and that's not helpful. I mean, try to remember, why did you become an academic? I mean, you know, whenever you feel like your work ba life balance is somehow not good, or wh whenever you're sort of feeling a little bit uh, the blues about your career, try to remember, why did I become an academic? And, and get that feeling out and think about, you know, 
it's still there and that's the thing i mean that calling that you had i mean many people become an academic because they feel this calling they feel that it's stronger than them they get they get pulled into this they feel this is what i need to do with my life remember that feeling right nurture that feeling be proud that you're doing what you wanted to do you know be positive about it and then of course take time for those other activities make sure that you do all these and if you have a mentor talk to a mentor about your uh, work-life issues right okay um teaching and service and i wanted to say a few words about teaching and service uh because look uh, I also see a lot of colleagues who become a little bit negative about teaching and, and, and service towards their institution because they feel that it's taking time away from research, which is what they mostly want to do and which they feel is the most important thing for their career. I would say the following. Always remember that most universities are run by academics and by some non-academics, but you know, Universities are often run by academics and most universities make a big portion of their money from education. So you must be ready to teach because that's how the money comes in that pays your salary. Just being realistic, you have to be willing to teach. It's unrealistic in this day and age, I would say, to start an academic career and to think that you never want to teach. If you're not willing to teach, do something else. Don't, don't do an academic career because you're likely to get disappointed. You're likely to be slammed with teaching that's then going to be a frustration to you. Instead, make sure that you're interested in teaching and make it fun to teach. Make sure that you teach things that you want to teach and that, that, that give you pleasure, right? Learn to engage with students. This is part of our mission, is to form the minds of the future generation, to help future leaders, right? And, 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 and the people who are going to build the future, to help them to build up the skills and the competencies and the knowledge that they need in the future. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. And the other thing, you know, you have to be ready to do some sort of administrative work, service work, you know, committee work, leadership work because otherwise the the university will not run a university will not run unless there are people willing to be you know program leaders to be a, a heads of department or deans or vice deans uh, or who are willing to um, coordinate the research seminar or who are willing to sit on hiring committees or promotion committees or phd committees I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and somebody has to be willing to do it. And so if you take the attitude that you refuse to do anything, your colleagues are going to ha hate you, you know, because then they're stuck with more work. Whereas if you put up your hand and say, hey, I'm willing to do, uh, to do something here. I would love to pitch in. They're going to love it. Your institution is going to love it, right? Your colleagues are going to love it. You can decide, and that's the positive thing, you can, to a large extent, decide what you want to do. I mean, you don't have to um, do something that you don't want to do. So if your dean asks you, would you be willing to serve on this committee? And you think, this is not the committee for me. Just tell them, look, I don't think that's the committee for me. I would really love to do this or this instead. And then at least you've shown that you're willing to do something, right? Uh, so really important this. You're a teacher. So balance your own interests and the needs of the institution. So in terms of teaching, say yes selectively, but do say yes, right? And that's the point. What, you, what I would advise is that, uh, actually I would advise that you think about what do you wanna teach and think about it as your core course. What should be your core identity in terms of teaching? And try to not uh, focus on something really uh, specific. So don't say, oh, I want to teach, but I want to teach a course on this particular theory as it relates to this particular practical problem and blah, blah, blah. Maybe you're in a position where you're able to create such a course in your institution. You know, an elective course on some sort of minute little thing. Or 
maybe you're able to do it for example at a phd level to make a course which is really like nitty gritty on some particular thing but i would always recommend find a core course you know hrm marketing strategy supply supply chain management microeconomics finance whatever it is and say this is where i want to be and then get yourself onto that core course make sure that you move into that core course and that makes you more saleable on the job market so it's it makes it clearer for people to understand who are you who is christian christian is professor of strategy okay he's the strategy guy fine he runs the strategy course i understand that and that makes christian more saleable on the market if i wanted to change employer and go to another university they would know exactly where do i fit in right and they would know exactly what could i teach it would be very easy um if i came and i said oh my teaching experience is on a sense making theory as applied within blah 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 you know they're gonna think well hmm, so how do we use this guy i mean where can he teach right so think about that i mean uh figure out what your core course should be and try to get on to that and then as i said earlier build a positive mindset about teaching as a 21st century academic you are a teacher there are some opportunities as a teacher so it's really useful also to have a positive mindset about those opportunities you have the opportunity to build sets of materials that can be recycled reused that's really useful if you if you if you stick to a core course you can build materials that you are able to take with you they're transferable from one course to another from one university to another um, teaching and gaining experience as a teacher also actually gains you experience as a public speaker so if you want to you know if you want to become better at public speaking actually gaining teaching experience makes a lot of sense right there's also the opportunity of developing your own material there there's you know you don't have to take existing material you could develop your own for example i have developed a number of case studies right um I, i've even published a case study in a, in a journal and um and uh another one in a in a in a book uh, as a book chapter um i've made some video cases so you know you can develop your own materials which is actually fun and interesting right you can even publish those materials as i just said um, or you may develop some teaching related research papers as a teacher you have access to students you can even collect data you can do surveys on your students to collect data that could be relevant for a research paper um, teaching also allows you if uh, if you want to engage with practitioners so for example by writing case studies uh, by asking practitioners in to give uh, guest talks in your lectures this allows you to gives you a platform to meet practitioners and 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 talk to them or you could organize company visits i've done all of these things by the way and and it's been fun i've been able to contact companies and say listen i have you know uh, 20 mba students or i have 40 bachelor students um, and i would love to come and visit your company and to talk to you about strategy what do you think more often than not these companies are going to say yes they'll think it's interesting because you're bringing to them potential future employees you're allowing them to brand their company uh, in the university so in that sense it's a, it's a win-win you can also as a teacher identify bachelor or master thesis students or even future phd students if you're not teaching it's hard to find students to identify students who have the potential uh, to be interesting uh, to supervise in the future right but if you're teaching you're able to identify those uh, students by the way being an, uh, an engaged teacher also allows you to build social media uh, uh, followers because many of my former students for example seek me out on linkedin um, and and so you know it's a nice way to build actually a, a following and of course you're inspiring future leaders i mean that's a really positive and a great uh, thing to do so when it comes to service um, just like with uh, teaching of course choose a little bit carefully you should consider your career stage okay um, so depending on your career stage there are some of these things that are more obvious than others but i would say do something and the opportunities for service include committees as i've said before hiring committee promotion committee ethics committee funding committees and so on 
There are things like head of department, dean, and so on. These are the more formal leadership roles. There are slightly less formal leadership roles like head of a research group, uh, coordinator of meetings. You could offer uh, even, by the way, to be a secretary to committees. Um, I mean, I've seen some junior scholars do this with great success, basically to offer, for example, to write the meeting minutes uh, in department meetings or things like that. Um, this is a great way to get started uh, with service and people really appreciate it. And of course you have things like a director of studies, head of PhD school, and so on and so on. There are lots of potential uh, jobs to be done in, in a university. And as I said earlier, um, the institution is happy if you're willing to do something. So you can actually choose. You don't have to wait until somebody bangs you on the head and says, you have to do this. You can go in proactively and make suggestions. You can think about what would be fun for me, what would build my career, what would be positive in terms of my CV, and then go in and offer to do those things. The final topic I wanna, or two topics I wanna talk about is first of all, networking. Now, networking, again, I think that's an important thing for your career. And it's certainly something that um, I would not underestimate. You need to be visible at home. So at home, by that I mean in your home university and outside. Um, I have this kind of um, uh, saying, this mantra that, that I use for myself, which is say what you do and do what you say. So it's the idea that you should be open and transparent. That's what I use myself. So I try to be open and transparent about what I'm doing. I try to share what I'm doing with other people so they know what I'm doing. And I try to also do what I say. So I try to be honest and and actually stick to my promises, okay? Um, a good way to network is to be strategic about conferences, to think about what conferences could I attend where I meet a community that I wanna be a part of, okay? Uh, where I meet people who are doing similar research, for example, publishing in the journals I wanna publish in, uh, you know, that I wanna be known with. And, and find that, and one way to find that community is through conferences, right? So rather than choosing a conference which is in the best uh, touristy location, uh, think about where would be a good academic home for yourself. And then you could stick to that, right? So my academic home became the Academy of Management and in particular the MOC division, Managerial and Organizational Cognition. And that's been kind of my academic home. And today I'm actually sitting in the, in the executive committee of that um, division. And I've kind of been involved with that division for a long time. And it means that people know me and I know people and it's nice to, to meet those people again and, and work together with those uh, people. Um, it's important also to find, I think, co-authors you can work with. Uh, again, writing as a lonely, you know, being that sort of lonely hermit is, is, is difficult. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's a little bit uphill. If you can find co-authors you can work with, that certainly becomes an interesting thing. And you can do that by going out and being visible and networking. And then I would say, I would certainly recommend thinking about both building an online presence and that offline presence, right? So finding a community offline that you can meet with and that you can be a part of, but then also building an online presence. The online presence helps you to be visible. That helps the visibility element, right? And in terms of the online presence, my own recommendation would be as a minimum that you have a Google Scholar profile, uh, a ResearchGate profile, that you have a good page, an updated page on your institutional website, so on your university's website. And then I would also add to that LinkedIn. Uh, those are the ones that, that I use uh, the most actively, uh, but there could be others. And if you, you know, if you feel so inclined, I mean, the world, the online world is your oyster, right? I mean, you could have a YouTube channel where you, uh, where you upload lots of videos. You could, uh, you could, uh, you could be active on Facebook. You could be active on Instagram. You could Twitter, you know, whatever, right? So lots of uh, possibilities out there. And finally, I want to just say a few words about reviewing dialogue and rejection. Um, first of all, reviewing 
uh, understanding reviewing is really important. And it took me some years to understand the reviewing game and to understand the journal game, right? Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is just that uh, you should think of editors as the first and, and conference organizers, for example, as, as the first reviewers of your paper, right? They, they are going to review your paper before reviewers review it. And think of your job as avoiding desk rejection. In good journals, the desk rejection rates are above 50%. Even in a conference like the Academy of Management, the rejection rate is 50%, right? Um, for funding applications, it's not unusual to have uh, success rates that are, that are extremely low, right? Um, so think of your job to, uh, as, as being you want to avoid desk rejection. So you want to look at do I have a good fit with the journal that I'm sending my article to or the conference? And you can use the same thinking, by the way, for funding agencies, for an employer, etc. right? So think about fit. The second element is the quality of the manuscript. And of course, behind that, you need to have a certain quality of research. And if you meet all those three, if you have high quality of research, you have a high quality manuscript, and there's a clear fit with a particular journal, then you have done everything you can do to avoid a desk rejection. That doesn't guarantee that you avoid a desk rejection, but you've done everything that you could do, okay? Beyond that, the next step for your paper or application or whatever is basically, the next step is that you get reviewers. Now, one thing for, I, I would highly recommend for, from a career perspective is to accept rejection as a part of life. Any senior academic you talk to will tell you that they have experienced many rejections, many rejections. It is perfectly normal to get a rejection. And as a young scholar, I know it's hard because I've, I've been there. Um, and I see many young scholars who don't deal well with rejection, but you have to learn to deal with rejection. How do you deal with rejection? In my opinion, it's about your mindset. It's, it's your job to manage rejection and you manage it by having the right mindset. First of all, realize that reviewers always want to say something. If a reviewer gets a paper and they get asked to review the paper, they will feel as a reviewer that they, they would look foolish if all they sent back was a, yeah, this looks nice, I like it, yeah, sure, go ahead and publish it. I mean, that's not a review, right? That's just showing that you're not willing to do the work. So if you get asked to do a review, you're gonna try and do it seriously. And it's the same for all other reviewers. When they get a, a paper, they try to do a serious review and they feel like they have to say something. They have to actually say something, otherwise they're not giving a review. So they are going to look for something to say. Now, a good review, uh, a good review is a review that tells you what is good, or, or let's say the strengths of your paper, what's bad, right? Or let's say the weaknesses of the paper. And then what can you do about those weaknesses? How could you improve the paper, okay? A medium quality review tells you only what's good and what's bad. And a poor quality review only focuses on what's bad. Okay. Now, when you get a review back from a journal, if you're unlucky, you get a poor review, you know, poor quality review, where the reviewer just says, ah, this is no good, your data is no good, your methodology is flawed, your blah, 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 the structure doesn't make sense, blah, blah, blah. You know, negative, 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 negative. I would say in the old days, there were more of those negative reviews, uh, those poor reviews than today. I mean, today, the quality of reviews has been improving, thankfully, but there's still some way to go. Make sure that if you review, that you're not a poor quality reviewer. Make sure you're a good reviewer and a good reviewer tells you what's good about the paper, what, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and what can you do about it? What can you fix? That's the developmental part, right? You're helping people to improve that paper. And hopefully that's the kind of review you get back. And remember, whatever the reviewers say, they don't know you. 
So don't take what they say personally. They're not out to get you. They're not, you know, they're not haters. No. I mean, they don't know who you are. If, if it's a double blind review, they have no idea. They just got a paper. They read the paper and they had some things that popped into their mind. What they like, what they didn't like, and maybe some suggestions for how you can improve it. Um, Try to view your interactions with editors and reviewers as a dialogue. It's not a battle. It's not you against them. It's not you against the haters. No. You know, they're just doing their job as well as they can. And maybe they do a good job. Maybe they do a poor job. Okay. Um, Take it for what it is. If you get a rejection, use the rejection feedback to find a better target because maybe it's because you sent to the wrong journal um, and to possibly revise your paper. Okay. When do you revise your paper? So if you get comments from a reviewer who say, ah, I don't like this or I don't like that, or I would suggest you do this or that, how much should you change? Well, certainly if you get two reviews, right? And both reviewers point to a weakness in the paper, both of them, are somehow aggravated by a weakness in the paper. You definitely have to fix it before you send it somewhere else because that's a signal to you that there's a high chance that you're going to get rejected again. You you got rejected. The reviewers agree that this is the weakness. If you just send it to another journal, there's a high likelihood that those reviewers are also going to find that same weakness, at least one of them, right? So if two reviewers agree on a weakness, I would say go back and fix it. See if you can do something to fix that paper, okay, to make it better, and then submit it somewhere else. Remember, your job is to avoid a rejection, right? You just want to try and avoid a desk rejection. Once you get a revise and resubmit, you know, then life becomes easier. Then you know what you're dealing with, right? Um, But until you get there, rejection is a part of life. Use it to improve, use it to become better, and don't let it drag you down, okay? You can, you know, if a rejection sucks, you can spend five minutes, you know, you can spend a day or two moping, but don't spend more time than that, okay? Get back to the paper, fix what needs to be fixed, and then send it on. Keep keep working. Don't, don't let it bring you down, okay? So that pretty much um, brings my presentation to an end. So my final words for you in terms of managing your academic career is figure out what works for you. This takes time, figure out what works and stick to it, right? Uh, and, and, and try to, uh, try to navigate your career um, in terms of teaching, research, service, all of these things, your private life as well as you can, all right? And don't, don't hesitate to seek help. Uh, don't, d- make sure you reflect on your career regularly and, and make sure that you stay positive and happy. And with that, I want to wrap up and just um, wish you every success in your career.